The City of Phoenix holds community budget hearings throughout April, allowing residents to comment and make suggestions on the City Manager's trial budget before final decisions are made. This public discussion is among the reasons the City's budget so closely matches the community's highest priorities each fiscal year. This is one of 12 hearings. This is hearing number seven, I think, so we're just right in the middle of, of the number of hearings that we're doing on the city's 2015-16 budget, so we're happy that you're with us. I wanna say thank you to our staff who are here. If the staff would raise their hand. These are folks who are available to ask, answer questions if you have them from any of our departments in the city. They're not getting paid extra to be here. This is part of their regular job. I really wanna thank you guys uh, for coming out and being part of the hearing process with us. With that, I will invite Councilman Kate Gallego, who is our host this evening in our wonderful District 8, to say some words. Wonderful. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening to help us have a stronger city. And thank you to the city staff who is here to help us in case we have answers to questions already um, or to find out more information. A, a few people have said they were very glad that we're having it here because they'd been meaning to come back and see one of our gems of our city, so I hope we've whet your appetite and that if you like what you see, you'll come back and enjoy the museum and area. I want to introduce Joaquin, Kara, and Courtney from my team uh, in case people have questions or need anything from us and they can also help you if you want to attend our bicycle safety events and other events coming up. But thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you, Councilwoman. And so with that, we will uh, roll the video, which will give an overview, and then we will open it up for questions, comments, concerns, issues, anything that's on your mind. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. I missed your name. I'm sorry. I'm Ed Zerker. I'm the city manager. Thank you. Thank you. Let's roll the tape. Hello everyone and welcome to one of a dozen hearings on the City Manager's 2015-16 trial budget. Input from our residents is so important and helps shape what will end up being the final budget for the next fiscal year. The final budget is important because it provides the plan for how the city will spend taxpayer money and how services that you depend on could be impacted. I'm really pleased with this trial budget because it represents a year of really hard work. Leadership by the mayor and council to make some tough decisions, our employees who took concessions and who've worked hard to save money, and our partnership with our residents to bring a balanced budget for 2015-16. Why is a balanced budget important? It's required by state law and city charter. In this budget, there will be no cuts to the city services that you count on every day. I think it's important with this budget to know that we brought it into balance without cutting any services and we can actually add some very important things for the community. Even with state fiscal actions negatively impacting Phoenix costs and revenue, and with the sunset of the emergency sales tax on food on March 31st, the budget is balanced and important additions are being made thanks to the hard work of everyone. The funding for the city budget comes from different sources. It's not all coming from one place and, and it's divided into three main areas, the general fund, enterprise funds, and special revenue funds. Examples of general fund city departments include police, fire, the library, parks and recreation, and streets. Enterprise fund departments include aviation, water services, solid waste services, and the convention center. Special revenue funds account for designated sources of money for a specific purpose, like sales tax dollars for the hiring of police officers and firefighters, and funds for public transit. So when you look at all of those areas together, that's really the diverse mix of all the things that makes up our city budget. The mayor and city council took action early on, leading us to a balanced budget. That includes eliminating 162 full-time general fund vacant positions last December. For a second year, additional employee compensation concessions at just under 1% 
And over the last several years, the city has eliminated nearly 100 management positions and cut overtime costs by more than 50 percent. The efficiency efforts by city staff have been remarkable. The city is less than $2 million away from reaching its 2015 savings goal of $100 million over the past five years. The mayor and city council have also led reforms of the civilian pension system. In total, we can expect to see a savings of around $830 million over two decades thanks to the actions already taken by the mayor and city council along with the city pension board and voters. This will have a positive long-term impact on the budget, although there is still more work to be done. In addition, the zero-based budget review process, looking at every program, has led to $1.2 million in savings for 2015-16. Every line item in the budget was scrutinized, which allows the city to find ways to save. Among the savings, $600,000 by closing two courtrooms where the number of cases has dropped considerably. $225,000 saved in the finance department by relying more on technology and reducing postage costs for mailing monthly statements. $200,000 in street transportation by analyzing signage and determining which road signs are unnecessary to install, maintain, or produce. These are just a few of many ways that staff has found to improve efficiency. To see the full list of savings, check out the budget summary packet provided at these budget hearings and is also available on phoenix.gov. One of the biggest challenges the city faces this year has to do with what's happening at the state level. In an effort to balance its budget, the state has shifted costs and reduced revenue to cities like Phoenix. That has led to a $6.3 million negative impact on the city, which in turn eliminated a $4.3 million surplus, which would have been used to address important city needs. This created a $2 million deficit. To balance it out, here's what the trial budget suggests. Holding off on replacing some older city vehicles and equipment, along with slowing the growth of the city's contingency fund, which is still at its highest level in city history. Here's a look at the new services proposed in the trial budget. First, let's look at the general fund. The budget adds $14,000 for implementing full-time recreation at the county-provided Cofelt Rec Center, it's located at 19th Avenue in Buckeye. That means the existing rec center will be filled with kids year round. In the area of innovation, the budget adds a business analyst to begin preparations for Phoenix 311, which would provide a centralized information center, as well as identifying technology needed to implement a unified municipal services card. And many residents feel that protecting the public should be the city's top priority. That's why public safety amounts to 71% of the general fund in this trial budget. This budget adds an additional $2 million for 40 hours of police officer training for every officer. Now to dedicated public safety special revenue funds. Due to the fact that these funds will be balanced next year, the budget includes the hiring of 110 police officers in 2015-16, which will increase the size of the police force from where it is today. The council also approved a plan to hire 90 firefighters next fiscal year after hiring approximately 75 this year. Now let's look at dedicated Phoenix Parks and Preserves Initiatives funds. Those funds would provide maintenance for three new desert preserve trailheads, creating more opportunities for residents to enjoy our preserve trails. From the Development Services funds, which is paid for by building permit and inspection fees, is this proposal making for a better customer experience in planning and development services with improved technology and training and more staff to enhance the electronic plan review section and the front counter service. Now to dedicated transit funds. The light rail is seeing more riders now than ever before. The proposed budget would fund rail operations for the new Northwest extension to 19th Avenue and Dunlap. 
Out of dedicated aviation enterprise funds comes an important improvement at Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. It's one of the 10 busiest in the nation. The trial budget calls for the addition of a dedicated team at the airport to analyze noise impacts of flight activity, assess any proposed changes by the FAA, and to reach out to the community to solicit feedback and exchange information. Out of the Solid Waste Special Enterprise Funds, the trial budget calls for operating a composting facility which will divert several tons of green waste per week from the landfill. That facility is scheduled to open next year. But the list of community needs continues. Among them, police body cameras, addressing homelessness, restoring library hours, after-school programs, support for arts programs, park maintenance, and street maintenance and street landscaping. Any budget requires trade-offs, and street landscaping is an example of that. It is important to keep our city beautiful and safe by making sure trees and shrubs along the roadways are maintained. Right now, that happens when residents make a report, but that could soon change. The council will soon vote on whether to bid for the service, which means the roadways would be regularly maintained three times a year. Although funding is not currently available to increase this service, the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee is evaluating additional options which would increase the frequency of street landscaping service with added costs estimated to range from $1.5 to $6 million. Additional funding sources would need to be identified. So the 2015-16 trial budget is really good news. We've balanced the budget with no cuts to services, and in fact, we've added some things that are important to the community. But we always want to be looking ahead, and so we have a five-year plan we have forecast ahead, and we see that we have some issues to deal with after this year. One of the biggest challenges to the general fund, public safety pension costs. Much work has been done on the civilian side, controlled by the city, but the state-controlled system still faces challenges. This trial budget assumes phasing in added public safety pension costs over the next three years, allowing city services to be preserved. Also, revenue growth will be affected by actions taken by the state on income and sales taxes. The city is planning ahead on both of these issues and will work hard to address them over the next 12 months. Keep in mind, the budget hasn't been adopted just yet. Your input is important, and the City of Phoenix wants to hear from you on what the upcoming budget should look like. Twelve public hearings will take place this month across all council districts, and you are encouraged to attend. You can also send your comments or questions to budget.research at phoenix.gov, or to reach out to us by phone, call 602-262-4800. You can also comment on social media by using hashtag Phoenix Budget. Thank you for being part of a very important process. The City of Phoenix is committed to its mission of improving the quality of life in Phoenix through the efficient delivery of outstanding public services. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so now's the time for us to hear from you, from the public. Uh, as I mentioned, if, you, if things come to you and you want to comment later too, you can always send us something by email or over social media. I know we've received almost 130 comments already uh, just on the issue of library services alone. So we are getting uh, feedback through email as well. But we'd really love to hear from those of you who took time to come out today. And so we will start with our first speaker, who is John Walker. Mr. Walker, thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is John Walker. I'm a uh, long-time Phoenix resident. I've lived in Phoenix for almost 25 years. I'm here on behalf of Phoenix spokespeople. I'm asking for more money uh, to be spent on bicycle infrastructure. Um, why does Phoenix need, Phoenix need more bike infrastructure? Um, Phoenix needs transportation options. Uh, no city has ever solved its transportation problems with single occupancy vehicles. 
Uh, you think about tri cities that have tried or moved in that direction, Los Angeles and Shanghai, large metropolitan cities, and what you think about those cities is not a great way to get around, but you think about pollution and sprawl. And I think without change and significant change, Phoenix could end up like this. Um, I think light rail is a huge step in the right direction, and it's been a great success. Ridership is uh, through the roof. Grid bikes, the bike share system that came online recently, has also been a great success. There's been a lot of use for that and a lot of demand for that. Um, bike infrastructure has to, be, has to come before the cyclists start to uh, ride around the city. You can't expect the cyclists to come out in a city where it's not suited for them. And, and I think Phoenix needs to move in that direction, and we need to spend money to do that. Um, driving less. Millennials want to drive less. They want to use light rail. They want different ways to get around. Urban living is becoming more desirable, and I think Phoenix has a great advantage in that sense. Uh, they can offer those opportunities, but you have to have transport options in order to do that. And when I mean bike infrastructure, I don't just mean bike lanes or sharrows. Um, or paint on the ground. I mean protected bike lanes, lanes that segregate the car from the driver. And that's the main thing holding a large po percentage of the population from riding bikes every day is not having that protection. And if we start putting that in, in Phoenix, like many other major cities have done, I think we'll see a huge increase in, in biking. Um, 8 to 88 is, I think, a number that we need to think about. Kids as young as 8 or as old as 88 should feel safe riding bikes on the street to get places. Um, ask yourself, would I feel comfortable allowing my child or my grandparent to ride a bike on this street? And if your response to that is no, then the bike infrastructure is still lacking. Um, what I'm asking, what I think uh, the Phoenix spokespeople, and we have over 1,500 members, um, are asking is that the city spend at least $1.50 per resident per year solely for bike infrastructure. This comes out to about two and a quarter million dollars per year, and it's less than 0.02% of the budget. It's a very small amount, and compared to other cities, uh, as a fraction of the population, it's much smaller, but I think it would be a great start. So I'd really appreciate that if the city moves in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next we have Steve Poe. Good evening. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. My name is Steve Poe. I'm with the Rawson House Heritage Square Foundation, and I am vice president of the board. We, of course, are a nonprofit partner with the city of Phoenix, and we manage the Heritage Square along with our partners and tenants, the Rawson House, the Arizona Science Center, Nobu, Pizza, Pizzeria Bianco, and the Rosen Crown. I'm not here to ask for money this year. Uh, what I am here for is to thank you very much for our ability to continue operating the Rawson House and help with Heritage Square and help you by returning money to the budget from the rentals of the Lath House and the businesses that are part of Heritage Square. One last thing, I want to make sure that you are aware of Saturday, May 2nd, which is the Gin and Jazz Preservation Party at Heritage Square. We're celebrating the 35th anniversary of that park this year, and we certainly hope that you will all be able to attend. Thank you very much. Just to clarify, you said Gin and Jazz. Gin and Jazz <laughs> Preservation, yes. I like that. Thank you. I just want to go back and say to Mr. Walker, so one of the things that we have that's not in our operating budget, but in our capital improvement budget, we do have some significant resources to bike infrastructure. And that uh, capital improvement program will be reviewed by the council tomorrow, just as an opening uh, view of that as well, and it will be acted on in June. So I'd invite you and any other resident to take a look at that. It's at phoenix.gov slash budget and the full detail of the whole CIP, but there's also a bike infrastructure piece within the street section that um, would be informative to you as well. But, but thank you for your comments about, about bikes, and uh, we will make note of that too. So thank you. Uh, third, we have Joseph Banesh.
Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman and City Manager. I, too, am, am not here um, screaming and hollering today, which is a nice change from previous years. Uh, I'm here with three hats on. My name is Joseph Benish. I'm a new homeowner in District 8. I am also on the Commission for the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, and I'm the Director of the Phoenix Center for the Arts. And uh, so I want to say thank you for the budget. Uh, I also want to say next year, let's, let's add a little bit more for, for arts and culture. The reason why I say that is because we know now that arts and culture really contributes to the quality of education for our kids. There are three arts organizations. Uh, there's Arizona School for the Arts, which is a school. There's Rosie's House, which serves only low-income children who are often classified as at risk. And there's the Phoenix Conservatory of Music. These are three organizations I know fairly well. And the average graduation rate of our college, of our, of our high school seniors is you know, 60, 70 percent, depending on what state you're in. Our college readiness rate is far, far lower than that. And all of three of these arts organizations, unrelated to each other, have a 97 to 100 percent graduation rate for their seniors. There's a very clear common denominator there. Not that the arts are the only answer, but they're one part of education that is often the first thing to be cut and lost for our kids. The uh, artists contribute significantly to our economy. We know there's a, a one to seven return on our dollars spent, and that's because artists are often in the original entrepreneurs. We do a lot with a little. And we're also, I think, the, the original localists. Artists, as you probably know, if you have any friends who are artists, they go to local restaurants. They send their kids to public schools. Their dollars stay in our community. At Phoenix Center for the Arts, in the last three years, we've hired five full-time staff who are getting benefits and dozens and dozens of artists every year that, that we keep employed. And then uh, lastly, on, if I can read my writing, oh, Something that's not talked a lot about in the arts is our public safety value, like after school programs. It's a lot cheaper to pay an artist f for an hour to serve and keep engaged 30 kids or more and keep them off the street than it is to pay somebody else to, to police them. And I'm not saying less police, I'm saying all of the above, because I have friends who are police officers and they do an amazing job. But we can make their jobs easier if we are paying artists and after school programs to take care of our kids, keep their minds and their hands busy. So in the future, if we can add more to the budget, and I'm saying thank you for this budget, then we can serve more of our kids and give them a more complete education. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, and thanks for what you're doing at the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Next we have John Eichenauer. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to express ourselves at these 15 or so budget hearings. Several articles in the Arizona Republic over the past few weeks and months indicate that the city, not only Phoenix, has difficulty in settling the spikes in retirement benefits for policemen and firemen. And I would hope that this evening you might be able to give us some short explanation of why this never seems to get settled except at the cost of various services. On one occasion, the closing of a senior center. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eichenauer. So I can explain a little bit about the pension, because that's a very important question. We mentioned a little bit in the, um, in the video presentation. There are two <coughs> pension systems in the city. One is for civilians, and one is for our sworn public safety, police officers and firefighters. The civilian pension system is controlled by the Phoenix City Council under the charter of the City of Phoenix. And the Phoenix City Council, uh, and with, with Ms. Gallego is in the majority on that, 
have made significant pension reform under the civilian pension system in the last three years. And so that is what was referred to as where there is over $800 million worth of savings. And in fact, there will be another pension reform uh, to the ballot this fall for another $30 million, $40 million of savings. But you asked specifically about the, the public safety pension. So the public safety pension is controlled by the state of Arizona, the authority of the state legislature. And the state legislature is in control of making any reforms to that system. So in the last 10 years, the stock market has had two significant downturns, actually the last 15 years, two significant downturns which continue to affect the funding, the amount of funding in that system. So that's one thing that really hit it hard. The uh, second thing that's, that's happened that's really significant was a set of reforms that the legislature tried to enact in 2011 were declared unconstitutional by the Arizona Supreme Court. And so a whole bunch of money has to go back in to repay people who, who were under that reform that was changed. So those two, those two things mean that there's a big bill due for us to pay the obligations we have for pensions for our public safety officers. And we, need, we have to meet those obligations. It's our, it's our duty uh, under the law and in, through contracts, commitments. So what we're saying is we need to have legal constitutional reform enacted at the state level to start bringing down the costs of those public safety pensions. And that hasn't happened yet. And so that is where our cost increase is coming from with regards to public safety pensions. And so there has to be some reform taken at the state level. And the reform they, they take needs to be done in a way that doesn't get declared unconstitutional because then we have to go back and repay it anyway. So that's where we stand today, that there's, there's a need in the next year for something to happen, some action to be taken at the state level. You. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Kedrick Ellison. Councilwoman Gallego, City Manager Zerker, thank you for the opportunity to speak on our budget here tonight. I'm a resident of District 8, and uh, I've enjoyed living and participating in our community all my life. For the past 17 years, I've been president of the Acatillo Library's chapter of the Friends of the Phoenix Public Library. I've also been an educator at South Mountain Community College. I'm here today asking for your support to promote having every library open every day. Recently, I posted a comment in support of our Phoenix Public Library as a finalist for the 2015 National Medal for Museum and Library Services. I'd like to briefly read some of it. If there's an agency that can claim to be everything to everyone, then the Phoenix Public Library has a valid claim I was awarded my first library card by Phoenix Harmon Library during the 1960s when I was in elementary school. This portal not only supplemented our small school library, it opened a world of learning through various reading programs and after school activities. I've continued to use our library throughout my high school, college, postgraduate education journey. As a business consultant and an educator, I frequently direct business owners those dreaming of starting a business to our Phoenix Public Library. We have rich resources there and they include programs related to business ownership and for those who are looking for jobs, we have for individuals seeking employment, there are workshops for finding a job. Our libraries have actually helped people find jobs. For those with children and grandchildren, the Phoenix Public Library has provided a learning environment through reading programs for babies, tweens, teens, and young adults. Even older adults can enjoy book clubs and other reading activities. It's because of these, end of quote, because of these innumerable community benefits and more that our Phoenix Public Libraries are everything to everyone. And the critical role that our libraries play as a community resource should be available every day. We've heard statements describing how educational resources are under budgetary attack. Opening every library every day is another way we demonstrate to our community that we're all in. Thank you. Thank you, Kedrick. And as I said before, we've received almost 130 comments from various library supporters already. 
on that subject of every library every day. We're going to be assessing what the cost is of that, and uh, just so that people know what that is, but appreciate you uh, speaking here tonight. Thank you. Our final speaker, and if, if anybody is inspired that they would like to speak after hearing this, please fill out a card. We still have time. Uh, the last speaker card we have is Chris West. Mr. Zirker, uh, Councilwoman <clears throat> excuse me, Gallego, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Chris West. I am the co-chair of the Arizona Professional Animal Cruelty Task Force, and I'm here representing Arizona Humane Society as the field operations manager today. Uh, the Arizona Humane Society believes that every pet deserves a good life, and to that end, we've been passionate in our goals in serving a critical role in the community for nearly 60 years. By providing affordable veterinary care, emergency rescue and ambulance services, community outreach and education, we have given second chances and hope for countless Valley pets as well as people. While many Phoenix residents understand and know to call the Arizona Humane Society if they see a sick or injured pet, many do not know the full role that the Arizona Humane Society provides in animal cruelty, uh, most of the time as the first responder. Last fiscal year, my emergency dispatch center received over 5,000 calls, individuals for services, resulting in over 8,000 visits to residences throughout the valley or throughout the city of Phoenix. <coughs> district 8 by far has doubled the near than any other district in animal cruelty calls. Sorry. We respond to abandonments, failure to provide food, water, and shelter, lack of abuse, as well as two years ago responding to three cockfights in the period of one month in District 8. Uh, working collaboratively with the police department and the city prosecutors, we've provided appropriate care, housing, and shelter for these animals, as well as assisting in the prosecution and testimony in court is absolutely heartbreaking to witness what my EMTs go through on a daily basis, but without them, we would not be able to provide this invaluable service to the community and do what's right for the animals. Together, we can save more lives and witness more happy endings. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thanks to the Humane Society. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Chris, and thanks to the Humane Society for the work you do uh, with our police officers and firefighters. Appreciate that. Uh, Charles? Yes. Would like to make a comment. Well, most of you men that were up here gave the good news about Phoenix, but you should realize that the certain area in Phoenix I lived in at one time, I northern and northwest around Camelback and 40th Avenue apartment complex. I had to move from that area because of high crime to the southeast part of Phoenix, opposite direction to get, to get away from that area. It's a high crime area, and the police is called in all the time, about uh, three, four times a day sometimes. And there's been a lot of incidents that were on national TV, local news here, about the residents being uh, burglarized and uh, beaten up, and the many incidents of having obstacles thrown at them. Now, I talked to a few other people, and they moved out, and other people say they <coughs> like to see the place bowed down, bow those down, and make out a golf course out of it to keep peace in there. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Is there anyone else here this evening who would like to speak, give comments? Well, we thank you very much and thank our employees. Uh, Councilman Gallego, I'll ask if you will uh, end, the, end the meeting for us. Wonderful. Thank you again for everyone who joined us. We had a lot of leaders from across District 8 and the community, and we're glad to have your support and help and suggestions. 
And since we did have Rossen House early, I would say that Rossen House uh, and Heritage Square, number one and number two restaurants uh, in downtown, according to the Republic this weekend. So if you want to go out to eat, one possibility. And want to thank everyone here again, including our employees, for their very valuable time and for the great suggestions. Thank you very much. We will have a few more budget hearings. And then on May the 5th, there will be presented another uh, a version of the budget based on all the input that the council will consider, and then they will take an action on May the 19th. Thank you for coming. You've been watching a community budget hearing held recently in Phoenix. For questions, comments, or ideas, please visit phoenix.gov or call 602-262-4800. You can also send feedback or videos through social media at hashtag phoenixbudget. This video can also be seen online at phoenix.gov forward slash 11 or youtube.com forward slash city of phoenix az.